So the, that was the question, what are we using for scanning today? You have DataWedge, you have EMDK, you have Enterprise Browser. Is there anybody here who haven't used any of these products? EMDK, DataWedge, no? Okay. <clears throat> so just to introduce you, DataWedge is a service running in the background. And uh, it is responsible for scanning. It is responsible for delivering data to your application. You don't have to do a lot of programming, maybe nothing, no programming at all. There's an option to do no programming, and there is an option to do minimal programming. So that's DataWedge. It does the heavy lifting for you. And then you have EMDK. EMDK is an SDK. That means you're writing an application you're writing code to do the scanning for you. But you're using Java or Xamarin, using EMDK, to write your scanning applications. And the last option is Enterprise Browser. As it says, it's JavaScript barcode API using Enterprise Browser. So there is one. And you, you're also using Enterprise Browser, right? Yeah, but we're using Data mostly. OK. All right. So what, what can you do with scanning? There are so many features. These are just the major ones. There are literally hundreds of features that we provide for our enterprise users. And these, we just didn't come up with them. These, these uh, features were, uh, came, uh, came into use even in the CE Windows mobile time because these were asked by the, the field. And they start developing. We added more and more features. And they have brought, we have brought them into Android as well. So those who are using CE Windows Mobile Scanning, they are aware of these. They know what these features are. And those, um, these features, uh, like I said, uh, whatever we had in CE Windows Mobile, they were all brought into Android. And we have added more to that. And yesterday, I believe some of you were in my session, and there are still some CE Windows Mobile users here. How many CE Windows Mobile users here? Okay. So what are the options? Laser, imager, camera scanning. Some of our devices have laser scanning. Some of them have imager. Some of them have camera, and some, some allow camera scanning as well. Imager is probably the most uh, productive, most, uh, the fastest, uh, and the easiest to use. And we have Bluetooth scanning. Those who, can't, who want to keep their hands free, they can put their devices in the holster and then put the Bluetooth devices on their fingers and then do the scanning. Usually, you know, the, the, the parcel delivery, those kind of people who are carrying things around, they want to keep their hands free. We, we support over 50, I think it's more than 60 or 70 now. And decode feedback, when you scan, what should happen? Do you want it to vibrate? Do you want it to beep? Do you want it to see the LEDs coming up? Continuous scanning. I, I, wanna, I, I don't want to keep on pressing all the time. I want to keep it scanning without having to press anything or keep it holding and then uh, keep scanning. Secure, uh, the accuracy of the scanning, we are the best in, in, in the field as far as the accuracy and the speed is concerned. So there are several uh, features built in to, to increase the accuracy. Sometimes when you increase the accuracy, you have to give up something, maybe performance. So that may be just fine for most of you because you want the best out of the scanning, not necessarily that saving 20 million seconds, right? We are talking about million, uh, milliseconds here when we talk about uh, scanning. Uh, pick list for picking specific barcode out of a set of barcodes, timeouts, LCD mode. That means you should be able to scan off of the uh, monitors, LCD screens. Illumination for uh, brightness of the imager. Viewfinder for viewing. So you can have a viewfinder so you know what you're scanning. Uh, so pairing for the Bluetooth scanners, we have made it easy. So while you try to use the scanner, it comes up and says, you haven't paired with this, do you want to go ahead and 
pair with this, scan this barcode, and then you pair, and then you off. So you don't have to go out of your application to pair with a scanner. You can build all of this into your application. From an end user point of view, it is, a, a, it is one process, one application. So there, there is no break in the process and the workflow. Hard trigger, soft trigger. Soft trigger means programmatically, I want to be able to scan when I want it without having to touch anything. Or it's on the, the, a button on the device. I want to press the button and scan. Or we have hard triggers. On most of our devices, we have triggers on both sides. You press them, and then you can start scanning. And then you have preamble selections, those uh, data formatting as well. So these are some of the major features that people mostly use. Any questions on the, on the features? OK, let's get into, so the goal, to, uh, agenda today is to understand data wedge a little bit, understand EMDK APIs a little bit, and then understand enterprise browser a little bit, and at the end go back and see what are the plus and minus or pros and cons for all these options. And if you are using data wedge or if you are using EMDK, what do you need to do to take, make the best out of it? Or should you be using EMDK? Should you be using Data Wedge? If you are using EMDK, is Data Wedge a better option for you? Right? So that's the, that's the agenda today. <clears throat> so Data Wedge, so without having to go through one by one, I'm, I'm just going to come out and say how Data Wedge works, for those who don't know. Data Wedge is a service. It is, it is in the background. It used to poll the operating system and say who is in the foreground, which application is in the foreground. Now we have improved on it. Polling is not good. We all know that. So we have modified the operating system or the OSX layer, what they call in Google. And when an application comes to the foreground, it notifies Data Wedge saying that the application, uh, a new application is in the foreground. Not only do we say application, we go all the way to the activity or the GUI. Within this application, which activity is in the foreground? And once we know, we go back to in, into our database. That's where you come in. You could say, for my application, for this activity, I want you to scan. Or I don't want you to scan. I want you to scan with an imager. I want you to scan with a camera. I want you to disable code 39. I want you to do a bunch of other things, the, the, the features I mentioned before. You can enable, disable, modify, and format the data. All of those things you can do in your profile. And we save it in our database. And when the operating system notifies that your application is in the foreground, we go into the database and say, do they have a profile? If they do have a profile, is this activity registered with us? If this activity registered, boom, go do what you have to do. Now the scanning is running. Now you will be able to scan. And once you scan, well, two things can happen. Either you scan or it times out. And if it times out, it starts again. Or if you do scan, we go back into the profile and say, how do you want the data delivered? And we say, you say, I want it delivered like someone type, the, type it in. And then we do the same thing. We go into the key, keyboard queue and put the, the data into the keyboard queue. So your application receives as if someone typed it. Or you don't like that idea because you want to process the data because you are, you are scanning a 2D and that has, that has too much information on it to put it into a field. And what you do is you use the intents. You can say, send me an intent or send me a broadcast and pass me the data. You get the intent bundle. In the intent bundle, you get the name value pair of each field that you scanned. There may be one, only one set of data or there could be multiple sets of data. So <clears throat> I'm talking about intents and all of this. So that is getting into the Android. How many of you haven't done Android programming? OK. 
Okay, very good. Okay, so in a nutshell, Data Wedge wants to know who you are and what you want. You set up however you want it, either manually or through EMMs. You can push your configuration through EMM at any time. So it is not like you did it once and that's the end of it. Now you gotta go back to the devices to redo everything, no. So you did it once, it's all working, now you wanna change something. You wanna change the way it scans for a particular application or a set of applications. You re redo the application, uh, redo the configuration and push them all to your devices through EMMs. All of a sudden, application A, which was doing this for scanning, changes without having to write any code to it. That's the power of data wedge. And it also has the option of sending the data to a, a PC over Wi-Fi. You can set up data wedge to say, I don't want you sending it to my application, or I still want you to send, send it to my application, but I, I also want you to send the data to this IP address. Obviously, you've got to have something on the PC to receive the data, but Data Wedge does most of the work on the device for you. Okay? And yesterday we had, uh, in one of the sessions, we talked about how we are making use of this Data Wedge passing data to the PC through Bluetooth, and that is, uh, at, the, 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 at the hospitals, people are scanning uh, um, the, the barcodes of, of the patient and the drugs and the uh, instruments they're using, and that goes to the uh, line of business application, I think it's called Epic, on the PC, and then the data gets passed to the fields directly uh, on the PC. Okay? So, that's Data Wedge. It's a very powerful thing and for most people, it's very, very useful. In, in many cases where, where people are not using uh, Data Wedge, what we have come to know is uh, because probably there are very, very few cases where Data Wedge didn't work for them, for whatever the reasons, for their use cases. But for vast majority of people, more than 95% of people, uh, probably people don't need to write code EMDK code to do the scanning. They can do. They can use data wedge. All right. We talked about this. And, and by the way, this is there is no limit as to how many profiles you can do. You can create as many as you can, as long as the systems allows it in, in terms of memory. Uh, and uh, there is also a default profile. That means. You can pretty much say, I want you to use this profile for everything. And there is a launcher profile that means the home screen of Android. What do you want Data Wedge to do? Do you want to scan on the home screen and pass, pass data to an application? Or do you not want to do anything? Some devices come out of the box with Data Wedge enabled for home screen. If you scan it, it opens up Data Wedge demo and passes data into the demo. And some devices, they turn it off. Uh, the in the last three months. Okay. Yeah. Be, uh, because I found that uh, if, if the lock screen comes on, uh, or sometimes the data still works for a while. Oh yeah, yeah, the old version. So yeah. that was the polling, yeah. and uh, we didn't have a choice at that time. And I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. So we had set some timer. So the more you poll, the more you battery you're consuming, right? So we wanted to optimize that, and then the poll was set to some um, uh, few hundred milliseconds, and, and there was that lag in, in some cases, yes. It's out already for some of the... Uh, some of the, the latest uh, new devices coming out have them. Uh, the ones that came out in the last two to three months, they all have the, uh, the latest uh, data wedge. I, I can give you the version of Data Wedge if you want to check it that has this in. Okay. I think now like it's 6.3, 6.2, 6.3. Six, 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 six. 
60, yeah, I'm trying to yeah. figure out the version. But it's not just data widgets, the underlying components also have to change, so we got to look at both the versions. It's not uh, related to the version of operating system? It is, uh, the BSP, not, BSP also counts. Yeah, but if uh, it was related to BSP for QuickCAD or Marshall, or it's just for Marshall and up? So this was modified for Marshmallow and up. Okay. Not in the data wedge, but at the low level. Okay. Data wedge works across all devices, it doesn't. But we need that support from the, the low level, right? Okay. Okay. But the, yeah, the, that's, a, that's a good point because that's a major uh, uh, performance benefit there, right? So you, you saw the lag between yes. when the application coming and data wedge taking on. User was, uh, for example, user was not, was not looking at the mm. screen. I didn't find out that it locks and still was scaring and oh, it's not in my application. Exactly. And it could be the other way too. This is coming into an application, exiting an application, right? And moving to another application, there could be a delay because Data Wedge still thinks that it's in the old application and it's turned the scanner on. So that is almost pretty much gone now. It's almost impossible to see that lag. Oh, and also by the way, Data Wedge Data Wedge is designed in such a way it's a pluggable uh, application. That means where you get the data from, that is pluggable. One plugin is the scanning plugin. So you can get the data from scanning. The other option is MSR. And there could be more options as we, RFID could be another option. As we see more, uh, input sources coming in, we keep on adding plugins. So data, you can go and pick, oh, I want data from RFID and get the data from there, right? Uh, but it depends on whether we have the plugin for the source or not. So there is also a plugin for the data going out, a keyboard, intent, or IP wedge, what they call, that means it's going to an IP address. And there could be other opportunities moving forward. Well, one of them could be the MAC address of a Bluetooth. You could be passing to uh, a Bluetooth device on the other side. Okay, and the latest addition that we have added, uh, I'm not gonna go into the details of all of these things, but people always, some people said, oh, Data Wedge is great, uh, but I want that final control in my application when I want it. Data Wedge is you, you, you configure Data Wedge and let Data Wedge take over and do the work for you, which is great. But in some cases, I don't know what I want until I am running as an application, right? So uh, what do I do with this? That's why I want to use UMDK. But otherwise, Data Wedge is great for us, so the only reason I had to move to EMDK is because of this reason. Once in a while, we have to change things on the fly, and we don't know what it's going to be. And pushing, trying to push the, the, the new configuration file through EMM is too, too late at that time. Right? So that's when we came up with this, the model where well, why not use Data Wedge as an API interface as well? And how do you interface is the intent. Intent is one of the most premier uh, API interface uh, that Android uses for a lot of things, right? What are the advantages of inter uh, intent? Intent is you don't have to write APIs to new, create new AP APIs. Intent is the API. You pass value, uh, name value pair into the intent and the other, as long as the other person, the, the, the receiving application knows what the name value pairs you are sending, they can use it anytime. You can add more name value pair without breaking anything, right? You wanna do the same thing in API, you wanna add new fields, that might break the backward compatibility of an existing application. So you have to match. Here, let's say your application wants to use only five features, but we support 50 features, we only take five features from you and not use the rest. And for some reason, 
instead of using only 50 or doing 55, we only support 50. And when we see the rest of the five that we don't support, we just don't use it, right? So we added the inter intent interfaces. It was always there. We are expanding it now. Expanding it to the point that there is no difference between data wedge, what data wedge offers and what EMDK offers. EMDK offers all these features through APIs, right? You can control it at the level that you want it. And you could do the same thing in data wedge right now, and it is getting better. In the next two to three months, there won't be any difference between what you can do in EMDK and data wedge. Okay? So that's, that's, that's what these slides are. So I'm going to skip through them. Um, so this, these are some of the things that are already there. You can delete a profile, you can uh, query profile, enable, disable data wedge, uh, and then moving forward. You, you can also query who is in the foreground. What is the, the active profile right now? Okay, and there are more. These are, more are coming. These are some of the things that are gonna come soon or it's already there now. So, like I said, and also uh, on top of giving you all this intent, it also broadcasts status for you. Let's say a profile changed and your application needs to know that uh, a profile changed and the new profile. You can get that in your application. Data which sends it to you. If you don't want it, don't register for it. You don't care, right? And also, pretty much moving forward, all the st status changes that, are, that you can get information in EMDK, they're all going to come in, uh, in Data Wedge. Let's say that you, you, you squeeze the trigger. That's the status in EMDK. It comes back and says, hey, you're squeezing the trigger. You let go of the trigger. All that information is there in EMDK. It always was there in EMDK. Now that's all coming into uh, Data Wedge. An error occurred, or it was successful. You can get that back in Data Wedge. So we are covering pretty much everything. What you send, how you can configure. You can do everything now in Data Wedge that you could do uh, in EMDK. And the response you get back from the system you get all the responses in Data Wedge that are similar to EMDK. Okay? So that's Data Wedge. And let's look at EMDK APIs a little bit. Before I go there, any questions on uh, Data Wedge? Yes, that is querying the profile, right? Uh, no, uh, locking with password. So, uh, oh. the, so the uh, uh, creator of the application knows that if the profile it was set externally, mm -hmm. uh, he want to use that was uh, authenticated was with someone who can or how to change it. Change it. Okay, that's a good point. Um, we were thinking about it, whitelisting who can send the, uh, uh, the intents. That's what you're talking about, right? No, uh. no. Uh, be, uh, for example, uh, if developer goes to the application with, uh, and he wants to use that data wedge and set the profile of how he wants, uh -huh. and later uh, we can change the parameter of the profile externally. Right. Without changing the application. Uh -huh. But we can't change some of the profile things that. Oh, we, that has uh, that will, system profiles. Yeah, not system, uh -huh. but application profile, but it will, uh, so lo log it from not changing, so the application won't work because he, he will, the user who don't know the password and can go to the settings, mm -hmm. uh, can change the, prof the application profile so that the application won't work. So, so you, what you're saying is you, 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 those who can allow to change. Uh, will know the password and We'll know I how see. to change the, the profile. But, uh, so, do you manually change? Do you see the use case for manual change yes, or is I EMM? Uh, I think either manually or EMM. It's, uh, so, uh, we can discuss this. 
But for those who want to do EMM, you can block the configuration, data wedge yes. configuration, so nobody can get to that. That you can do. Yeah, I know, but mm. I still can, and uh, uh, there are some uh, operators, manager or uh. admin that have, can, can unlock the device from, from lockdown mm -hmm. and go to the settings and do it either on purpose or okay. just. So what you're asking for in a nutshell is data wedge configuration should be password protected, so, right? Yeah. Something like that. Let's take that as a, an action item. Okay, uh, any other questions? Th thanks for the feedback. All right, so next we are moving to the EMDK. Within EMDK, there are two options. Now actually it's gonna be three options. Because we added intents, you can use intent. But we also have profile manager which gives you access to, uh, to data wedge profiles. So what is the, the uh, who has used uh, profile manager here? Anybody has used profile manager? You don't count. Oh, sorry, not you too, the, the one lady behind you. She's troublemaker. Uh, okay. Uh, you have used Profile Manager? You have. So Profile Manager is, uh, is a GUI-assisted programming. So as you can see, that this is the Profile Manager here. All the features that are available, they're categorized in uh, uh, nice uh, uh, chunks of code, and they're available. Uh, those are called features. Within features, there are parameters or properties that you can modify. On CE Windows Mobile, a lot of these features were available through APIs. And if you wanted to do, let's say you wanted to modify some of the, the, the Wi-Fi features or Bluetooth features, you literally had to write hundreds of lines of code adding all these features into your code. Now with this, all you have to do is drag and drop and then chain the values. And when you chain the values, if it requires additional information, this is smart enough to chain the GUI on the fly to collect more information for that feature. And once you, you're all done with this, you can save it with the name, whatever you want. You can have however many profiles you want. And when you're ready in your application, uh, see, this is what you call process profile and give the name that you have created and then say set. When you're ready, you can go set it. And this, all this information you saved, that's all part of the XML that's saved with your application. And then we use it during the runtime when you call this API. Like I said, if you had to do the same things, you probably had to write, if not hundreds, at least tens of lines of codes. So why, okay, yeah, I don't mind writing code, but the problem is writing code takes time. And, and there could be mistakes. You might have to test a lot. You have to maintain the APIs. All of that is taken care of by us now. So Data Wedge is the ultimate, right? You don't have to do anything because it's doing most of the work for you. And next best thing is using the GUI for writing your code. So that's an option, profile manager, using profile manager to modify data wedge profiles is an option. Or now with the new intents coming in, you can use the intent in your applications. And you don't need even EMDK for that. You, all you need is Google API, send the intent. And for those who think, or who, uh, whose use cases don't meet the requirement for data wedge, or profile manager, and you want to control every line of code for whatever the use cases you might have, we still have barcode manager API, barcode APIs, right? And this is where you, you write lines. You start out saying that, what options do I have for scanning? What are those scanners? How many of them are Bluetooth scanners? If I haven't done the pairing with the Bluetooth scanner, can I do scanning with the APIs? Or do I have to go out of my application to do the pairing? No, I don't want to go out of the application. I do the pairing from my application itself. And then once you figure out what scanning that you want to use, and then you say, 
All right, I want to use this. Now I want to add some of the callback functions here. When the data is there, I want to receive the data, you add data listener. When the status of the scanner changes, I want to know in my application what the status is. You add the status listener. And then you can go into the whole configuration. You can use the default configuration, not do anything about it. Or you can control every little thing that's out there, literally hundreds and hundreds of features that are out there. You can say, I want to use a hard trigger. I want to use a tr soft trigger. I want to change the timeout. I don't like this three seconds timeout. I want 15 seconds timeout. OK? All of those things you can do. That's what you're doing here. Configuration before you start using. And then you enable it. And once you enable, <clears throat> and you wait for the idle status, and that is where you call the read. That means scanner is not doing anything, and now you're ready to scan, and then you do a read. Now, why is it important? If scanner is, let's say you had called the scanner, you are using the scanner already, and you're trying to use the scanner at the same time. It doesn't work that way. You gotta get in line. So that's where the status will help you. Wait till the idle status, and then call your read. And when you call read, that's when it enables the hard trigger for you to scan. Or if you choose uh, soft trigger, it starts scanning right away. Scanning, when I say scanning, the, the beam that comes out and ready to scan the barcode, there's a difference between soft and hard. Hard is, even though you want to read, you don't want to read until someone presses the trigger. And you don't know when they press the trigger. So that's why you set it to that state and then you wait for someone to press the trigger, right? The end, end user operator. Or you can say, I know, they got to do it now. So I'm going to programmatically say, let the, the beam come out and start scanning, and there is no need to press the hard trigger. So all of those things you, you have already taken care of, and then you call read. Now someone reads, someone scans, or they don't scan. If you don't scan, you get a no, uh, status notification saying that timed out or some other error occurs you get a status notification or if they successfully scanned you get on read okay sorry about that uh, okay okay on um, on read is not here in this code, probably it got removed. Uh, it's uh, an, uh, another notification where you get uh, um, a name value pair bundle coming back. And if there is only one data, you, you take the data and then you process it. If there are multiple, you iterate through it and then, okay. Uh, so I was told only 15 minutes, so let's get to this. And enterprise browser. Very quickly, HTML-based applications, either running locally or on the uh, web server. Uh, for JavaScript developers, uh, HTTP meta tag APIs. And if you need more information on any of the APIs, uh, either EMDK or enterprise browser or usage of data wedge, there is plenty of information that's available online, tech docs. Has anybody not been to tech docs? They, the, where our documentations are kept. Lindsay, you haven't been? Oh, I've been. Oh, okay. <laughs> Nader says he hasn't. Oh, <laughs> shame on you, Nader. <laughs> All right, I'm going to skip this. All right, so let's get into this comparison here. Yeah, see if we can do some discussions here. When do you use Data Wedge? When do you use EMDK? When do you use Enterprise Browser? No SDK distribution. You don't need any SDK. Even if you want to use Intents, you don't need SDK. So right there is a big, uh, big reduction in work for what you're doing. EMDK requires an SDK. You need an SDK on the PC, SDK add-on on the PC. And there is an EMDK running on the device that facilitates this. So you need both of them. Uh, and the enterprise browser, you require enterprise browser, downloading enterprise browser, and uh, it, it's even licensed. 
whereas EMDK, Data Wedge are not licensed. No or little coding is required in Data Wedge. Very little coding, even if it is there, processing intents, it is very easy to do. There are plenty of uh, samples that are available. Or if you choose the keyboard way of doing things, as if someone is typing the code into your application, you don't need to do any coding. EMDK, you use Android or Xamarin, you write code. You saw some of the code that we had to write to get it done, right? And the same thing with Enterprise Browser. Not only do you have to write code, you have to follow an order, right? You can't just go ahead and start scanning. You have to do certain things. You may want to configure. Don't injection. Huh? Don't injection on Enterprise Browser. Okay. Uh, no compiling, uh, recompiling requires. EMDK requires recompiling. It may require changes to the server code on the Enterprise Browser. Next one is no good citizen requirement. What does it mean? <clears throat> that means you can be a little careless. You don't have to be, you know, go read every little thing and then testing is easy because it's name value pair. Even if you're not processing in the order it comes in, that's okay. You can get it however you want. Whereas EMDK Enterprise Browser, you have to be a good citizen. That means you are following the order. You read the documentation. You know there are codes that are coming back. You better process it. Otherwise, it might lead to exceptions, right? That's like any other programming. You've got to invest in it. Uh, stop me if you have any questions, please. Uh, next one is uh, managed at MDM level. Data wedge can be managed at MDM level. Now, EMDK Enterprise Browser, we don't give you any tools to manage the applications at the MDM level. Now, can you do yourself? Sure. You can get something from the MDM and then you process in your application and you can apply them. But that is a lot more work than Data Wedge. You go create your profiles and push them through the uh, EMM slash MDM and then there, all of a sudden, Data Wedge behavior is changed. And if you want to do the same thing in your application, you may have to go and modify your applications, test it, and then deploy it, and then start using it. Fine-tuning app level. <clears throat> uh, well, the, this was one of the, the major things like I was describing before, right? Uh, data wedge, you, you have to configure it. Oh, it's going faster than I thought. <laughs> D data wedge doesn't give you any configuration options. Once you set it, it's all done, right? That was the main complaint. Thus, we change, like I said, with intent or through EMM. You can change it on the fly or through the EMM. So fine tuning at the app level it did not exist, but it's coming or it's already there in the device that you're using. EMDK, finest app level config options. Same thing with the enterprise browser to the min the, the lowest denomination you can, you can configure it. And within Data Wedge and EMDK comparison, no SDK distribution, we talked about it. No special project setup required. Here in the API side, you got to use the library distributed in the SDK. It is simple. We have tried to make it as simple as possible, but still that is work. You may have to install our EMDK installation. Data Wedge <clears throat> will automatically figure out who is in the foreground and apply those features and settings for that application the way you customize. In EMDK, you have to do it all by yourself. Now, is there, is it so complicated that your application for every little field, right, that you have to change? Then maybe the, 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 the the advantage between uh, Data Wedge and EMDK start blurring, but I haven't seen such kind of application where people keep on changing so fast. But even with that, intents you can do it. Right? App crash. If an application crash, Data Wedge is is not is a, is a separate process, and if your application crashes, it has no impact. Whereas with EMDK or any other way, you are integrating your application into the whole scanning process. If it crashes, you may have some problems. Although we have taken a lot of care on our side to keep a watch on crashing application and try to clean up. 
but sometimes your app crash can have an impact. Uh, easy to modify, this is the EMM part of it. Easy to modify the scan behavior by pushing profile without recompiling app. Requires modification to the application and testing and not to make sure you're using the right SDKs, you're using the right APIs. Uh, and then there is this intents are little slower compared to API. Very little, I say that there, because uh, it's very hard to say how slow, but we are literally talking about milliseconds, sometimes 20 milliseconds, sometimes uh, up to 100 milliseconds. And for most, most people, 100 milliseconds is not perceptible for what you are doing. So this is more of a us testing in the lab and then trying to see. So like I said, for 99 probably, I don't want to speak on behalf of you, for 99% of people that, that 40 milliseconds delay is not a big deal for the, the kind of advantage you get with intents. Uh, there is no special thread handling required. That's another thing, right? For, 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 for programmers here, you know that you don't want to block the thread when you're working with the synchronous calls. There are some synchronous calls in, uh, in EMDK. When you're setting the configuration, they are synchronous calls. And there are some asynchronous calls that is coming into a different thread in your application. So we all know how to do uh, asynchronous threading, but it is still a place where people make mistakes, even though nowadays tools have given so many options to process the asynchronous threads. Okay, uh, wait for the intern. Okay, so <clears throat> if you are doing two things or three things, for example, in your application, you scan a barcode, you take a picture, you come back to scanning, or do an MSR. <clears throat> That was much harder to do in Data Wedge earlier because you had to create three separate profiles and apply them when you wanted them because Data Wedge did not have a way of knowing, oh, you already scanned, so now I'm going to move to picture taking and then I'm going to move to uh, payment collection. No. That was harder, so you had to write EMTK application where you would scan it and then open the camera and then open the payment. Now, with the intents, you can pretty much do the same things. You can say, scan enable, scan disable, and then move to picture taking, and then move to the next one. Make sense? Uh, okay, and uh, we talked about intents. Uh, okay, so, and the last thing that was, that was missing in Data Wedge was, I don't know what Data Wedge is doing, because I have no clue whether it succeeded or not. Yeah, I didn't get the data, but I don't know what kind of errors occurred because Data Wedge is consuming all those errors. And EMDK, you get notification for every little thing, anything that went wrong, everything that went right. Now we are adding that in Data Wedge also. The status notification is coming back. So if you choose to read the status, you get all the event notification. Okay? It looks like I'm, I'm trying to push Data Wedge here. <laughs> For me, it doesn't matter because I'm going to support both of them no matter what, <laughs> whether you choose to or not. I'm, I'm trying to say, if your use cases meet Data Wedge functionality, why write more code? Okay, I think that's the last. Uh, and uh, this is uh, Eddie's uh, five minutes. Uh, tech Docs. Uh, this is where all the documentation is. We heard from a lot of you how you want to improve the documentation and a few other things. It is on it. Um, any questions or recommendations, suggestions? I would be wondering if you are, if you are using the data wedge, is it possible to get also metadata of the barcode, like type, yes. and print, and so on? All of them. All the information that you can get in EMDK, time and date, you get it. The symbologies of the barcode data that you scanned, you get it. Uh, what other information were you expecting? Well, it's just for the barcode type, basically. Yeah. But I don't like to have it written directly in my, in my data field. In, in, no, you don't have to. So, okay. How is, so, how is that? Um, keyboard, if you choose to go with keyboard, mm -hmm. it only sends data the, 
to the keyboard. It's not going to send the metadata. If you are interested in metadata, you got to go with the intent mechanism. Okay. With intent mechanism, you not only you get the data, you get a lot of other information related to the barcode itself. Scanners itself, but you may want to change the symbology. Isn't exactly. Okay, that's so. Let's take that down as uh, um, one is uh, password pro protected uh, admin usage, and the second one is um, editable uh, fields versus password protected fields. No, no, no. Uh, so, not, no, the, like in the profile and settings, there are options like uh, input, output, case stroke, in time, da, da, da. and uh, if the email will be from, uh, sent from uh, via AP, created the profile, so the, it will be just option, but this will be hidden, for example. So if I go directly in the database, I will, I will see the profile, but I won't see the options that will be hidden, so I can't change it. Okay, so you want the ability to hide the, the options in your profile? Yes. Okay. okay. No, that's a, that's a good one because um, it is the IT admin chooses which fields should be available to the end users, which fields are hidden from the end okay, users. Or developer, or mm. or oh, yeah, admin or developer. Uh, it's, it's coming together, but it should be more separate. Well, yeah, the, those are the separate use cases, right? Yeah. Uh, should developer worry about who uses what versus admins <laughs> worry about who gets to use what? Yeah. That's a good one, though. Yeah, thanks. Any other uh, questions? Or? All right. Thanks for listening. And uh, if you have any questions, please reach out to us. Because all the changes we have been bringing, all these new features, that's because we listen to you, we get feedback from you, and that's beneficial for both of us. Right? All right, thank you.